We'll continue with Dr. Vicki Baracco. Hello, my name is Vicki and I come from Canada. I was given the mission to speak about cut points and uh, uh, the, the, the pursuit of meaning therein. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that, but I'm going to take you on a short romp through um, CT defined skeletal muscle mass and its relationship with oncologic outcomes. Um, make some points about the need for standardization of the methodology. Um, show you the distribution of some CT defined features and their continuous relationships with cancer at, uh, outcomes and speak a little bit about cut points and approaches. So, I walked in the door of a cancer center in 2003 uh, where I was offered a full-time job and I had been tremendously influenced at that point in time by reading the wonderful work by Stephen Heinsfield's group from um, Columbia University validating uh, diagnostic imaging modalities for the precise and specific definition of human body composition. And uh, so, in, 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 in about 10 years ago, we managed to figure out how to do this in a cancer center where everybody has this diagnostic imaging. So, I'll, I'll not credit myself with anything. I looked to um, you know, aforementioned investigators to tell me how to do this in light of the fact, um, to begin with, that um, CT images were available for lots of patients. Um, but they were not of the whole body. They're almost never of the whole body. Now with more extensive PET CT investigations, we have more extensive images. Um, but we sought to narrow down um, to a usable image that, single image that in some way would represent whole body muscularity. So we, as previously discussed, um, launched on uh, Wei Shen's correlations to say, let's take total lumbar skeletal muscle cross-sectional area, um, which is at least reasonably well correlated with whole body muscle mass. This doesn't address a whole bunch of issues, and, and one of the gaps we have in this particular area at the moment is there are many cancer patients um, whose scan ends the last thoracic or first lumbar vertebra, and uh, we need a solution to the chest-only uh, CT image population if what it is we're going to do is use um, these serendipitously available CT images. The other thing that um, I'll not take any credit for is we also selected the uh, radio density values that we we're going to use for skeletal muscle and adipose tissue um, from the prior work. And so that is, it's an important point to understand that the area and the mean radio density that, that you're going to get is going to depend on where you set these thresholds. Um, so that is um, a, a feature in different studies that have been published to pay attention to. There's happily not as much wobble as, as you would anticipate in the use of these values. Um, so, um, it is, but it's important to note that um, many, many investigations have used a minus 30 Hounsfield unit as the upper bound of adipose tissue and the lower bound of skeletal muscle. So, what I wanna, I'm gonna go back a second. A great deal of people have used the approach that we use as lots of papers um, um, using total lumbar skeletal muscle cross-sectional area anchored at the third lumbar vertebra, um, though there's a, some slight variation in vertebral landmarks and a very occasional of choice of soft tissue um, landmarks like the umbilicus um, for, for landmarking, there is some variation also in the radio density ranges used by different people. And I think the one point I like to make about all this variation is at least where we're in a position where this is relatively new, it is actually quite beneficial to have a number of people doing these things all the same way because the, the, their data can then be aggregated. Um, there's also a group of approaches um, I'd like to, to mention, and I, I would call them shortcut approaches, and I have some reservations about them. Um, these, these approaches are in recent publications, and 
they often have a, an individual muscle selected for a reason not really stated. So you can find um, sarcopenia based on adductor pollicis only, on psoas only, and on pectoralis major only in, in the literature. And as I said this morning, I have some concern that these are really sentinel muscles for sarcopenia. One thing that goes with um, also with this area, and this is particularly bad in groups of people who are publishing on, on sentinel muscles, is that the, the units of measure are often all over the place. So we have muscle area, unadjusted for stature, muscle area adjusted for stature, length times width of the muscle, volume of the muscle, area multiplied by radio density, and, and, and widely discrepant radio density ranges. And this is going to generate a problem because data with such units of measure cannot be aggregated. So I'm going to now speak about some data acquired that are in the units of measure that we adopted as a convention, Susie's total lumbar skeletal muscle cross-sectional area uh, at L3. And I have to point out that this data is really continuously distributed. So for males, that would represent going from the bottom 10% to the top 10% in a group of patients with solid tumors. Um, from 100 to 204 square centimeters, or 34 to 66 centimeters squared per meter squared, which is the height adjusted value for women. Um, again, bottom to top 10 percentage, 72 to 137 centimeters squared, and 28 to 53 centimeters squared per meter squared. There's accumulating quite a bit of data in these units of measure. So I'd like to remind that that value, lumbar skeletal muscle index, is a continuous variable and can be taken at any value between its minimum and maximal values. We like to do two things with muscularity data. We like to make them into dichotomous variables um, or to ordinal variables, variables, and I'll be touching on those. So ordinal is more than one category and dichotomous is just two categories. These are the perspectives that we find on muscularity in the literature. So there's lots of representations that have already been given today looking at modeling the shape of a relationship between a feature and, and an, an outcome. And cubic spline modeling is just one illustration of a way of looking at the relationship between a feature and an outcome. This is, um, these relationships often have a polynomial aspect, so this kind of modeling, um, which is, allows fitting of complex shapes to relationship, I think is of value. So here's a really famous relationship between a body composition feature and an outcome, all-cause mortality, that we're all really familiar with. It's a continuous variable with a very characteristic shape. It has a low point somewhere in the middle and it goes up on either end. And this is associated with a concept that could, or a hypothesis that could be articulated by a healthcare professional or could be articulated by any lay person, which is that you're too thin or you're too fat and things are not gonna go well for you. We treat BMI not as a dichotomous variable, but as an ordinal one and it has um, six widely accepted cut points defining severely underweight, underweight, normal weight, overweight, and the three classes of obesity. So we have enough data to understand what this relationship looks like in relation to this outcome. Now we're getting into the business of taking this mass and dividing it into its component parts, one of which is muscle. And um, I highlight this paper, it's um, a large rumination by a bunch of people interested in cancer cachexia in a clinical setting. And I think they just have a, a nice way of articulating in this paper that um, cancer is associated with loss of muscle mass. And um, they, their concept is they try to pin on loss of muscle mass, the functional loss, the morbidity, and the mortality that is associated with progressive malignant disease. So they have a hypothesis, which is that muscle depletion is detrimental. 
the low muscle mass should be bad. There's nothing inherent in, in this conceptual framework that suggests, like overall body weight, that you could have too much muscle. So I've not heard anybody suggest that, that, that it was possible to have too much muscle. So this has all been touched on before, and I, I raise it again just to point out that we can measure muscularity, and in this case, there are large data sets available using dual energy X-ray. So the first thing these investigators did with muscularity is to look at the shape of the relationship. They did that specifically in men and women, and um, having determined the shape of the relationship, they um, then would be able to go on to do some kind of test um, for a cut point. So they have an outcome which has uh, related to muscularity, which has a shape. So the, the risk associated with muscularity has a certain shape. And it's possible to, to take that relationship and run a cut point test on it. And then that gives you a very simplified but clinically expedient definition. You have got this amount of muscle and you have that level of outcome. You have a different amount of muscle and you have another level of outcome. And so that is something that has been deployed all along in muscle business um, to define muscle cut points associated with elevated physical disability risk in older men and women. So um, this uh, beautiful work from um, some time ago gave us these cut points um, for moderate and severe sarcopenia in, related, in relation to physical disability um, in older men and women. So now I'm going to switch to cancer, and one of the limitations, in, I think, in the oncology area is we don't have very many big data sets. So um, this one, which was published this year, has about 735 non-small cell lung cancer patients just starting, they were treatment naive and just starting um, first-line therapy in a series of national clinical trials um, undertaken in Norway. This is a clinical trial data set, and um, these authors, this is part of the doctoral thesis of Georg Soblom, try to look at the relationship between muscularity, skeletal muscle index, and I'm going to be showing you data for men, and different things that they measured. So they looked at global quality of life um, using the QLQC30 and some of its subscales, including role function. I find these to be in interesting relationships because of how flat they are over the broad range of muscularity in men until you come to a precipice and fall off the cliff. And so this is a kind of relationship that looks to be quite nicely understandable in terms of there being a threshold um, for something bad to happen. And um, in this work, they also looked at the physical functioning domain of the QLQC30 and the evolution of fatigue. So these um, spline results are tested for um, p-value of association and for whether they're, they can be shown to be statistically significantly nonlinear. So this is, um, meets both those criteria for physical functioning, uh, is significant for fatigue, but doesn't quite make the, make the bargain for um, um, significant nonlinearity. So that's the first data we have associating muscularity with these types of outcomes in, in, in cancer patients in a big data set. So now I'm going over to a different outcome. So we're still in, in, in advanced stage solid tumors, and this is an aggregate of my data um, from Edmonton, Canada. And here I'm laying out for you, um, again, just in men, the relationship, and this is a hazard ratio for mortality by skeletal muscle index in men, and these are the going from the most muscular 10% to the least muscular 10% of the population. These hazard ratios are adjusted for age, sex, disease site, and stage. And so this relationship um, is, is basically continuous in the sense that the least risk category is the most muscular. And any decrement of muscle beyond that um, is associated with an increased risk of mortality. 
I want to make the point that this relationship is a, is a different shape than the other relationship I just showed you. So sarcopenia versus quality of life or sarcopenia versus mortality, each has its own distinct and unique shape. For my sins, and I've lived to regret this, I, we did a cut point analysis in data of this type back in our first paper with Carla in, in, in 2008. And that seemed to give us the message that sarcopenia was a bad prognostic in people with um, solid tumors of the GI and, and tract and lung. And then the cut points we solved, and now this is an obese, Canadian solid tumor data set um, um, were 52.4 and 38.5 centimeters squared per meter squared in men and women respectively. And those cut points appeared in the aforementioned Lancet Oncology consensus framework describing cancer cachexia, which was probably a little premature. Um, I, I don't think in hindsight we should have held up cut points solved on obese Canadians as the be all and end all cut points. So you can look for a revision of that. We subsequently looked at Canadians in the same population with lower BMIs and across the whole um, BMI range. Um, and that's useful, but we may pause also, also to consider that, for example, in Asian populations where people have a completely different inherent muscularity than, than in Canadians, um, something completely different will be found. Now, I'm going to, this will be complicated, but I'll ask you to bear with me to understand muscularity in relation to chemotherapy treatment toxicity. So there's two underlying hypotheses going on here. One of them is that people with low muscle are just not good people. They um, are, um, they have a low tolerance for any sort of stress. If you thought that, you would be inclined to stratify people by muscularity. An alternative hypothesis is that body composition that is associated with muscle depletion can alter chemotherapy, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. So consider these three women. They all have the diagnosis of metastatic colon cancer. I picked them because they're um, the most sarcopenic women um, available in my cancer center. Um, and I would like you to consider that these women are all similar in their lean body mass. So considering their skeletal muscle mass, which is identical, and their organs, they're pretty much about the same quantity of human being. Um, they're only different with respect to their slightly different quantities of fat mass. Now, this slightly different quantity of fat mass is going to pull chemotherapy dose because chemotherapy dose is adjusted to weight and height. So these three sarcopenic women will get progressively larger doses of chemotherapy. You're starting to understand, I'm going to draw you a more aggregate picture showing body surface area, the metric um, used to dose chemotherapy and lean body mass on the other axis. And um, we see that these things are correlated, but not that strongly correlated. And if you look across the red band, you will see that people of identical body surface area may have, um, because of their variations in muscularity, a 30 to 80 kilogram range in lean body mass, predicting a variation of dose per kilogram lean body mass that looks like this. So what you would be expecting here is that compared to the median person, so the, the person whose BSA to muscle mass ratio is at the median, people with relatively high muscularity would experience progressively less toxicity because they get a lower dose per kilogram lean body mass. And in the other direction, um, persons with a very high BSA relative to their lean body mass, so these are fat, sarcopenic people, um, would progressively get more toxicity because they're getting more dose per kilogram lean body mass. Are you with me? So this is the very first piece of work also from the thesis of Bjorg Sonblom, looking at this relationship in a large group of 
patients from a clinical trial. This is non-small cell lung cancer, and the stratification here is these, this is the BSA dose element of the regimen. So it's either gemcitabine, paclitaxel, or vinorelbane. And um, this was calculated according to the following or the theory I just gave you, that the dose per kilogram lean body mass would be a continuous variable, which turned out to independently predict grade three or grade four hematological toxicity. So this is the graph um, from that paper. This is the scary pointer. In the middle of the diagram, we've taken that as the reference category. So grade three, four heme tox um, um, in the, of, the, of, the, of the middle of the diagram is taken to have the odds ratio of 1.0. So if you go in either direction, I can use this great implement as a pointer. Continuous relationship between um, this metric, dose per kilogram lean body mass, wherein you go from odds ratio 1, 0.5, 0.3, 0.3, 0.9, and in this direction from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. So that kind of association might have something to do with excess exposure. So this um, axis dose per kilogram lean body mass is a theoretical construct, um, a fairy tale. Um, what we need is more determinations of uh, pharmacokinetic data in relation to these body composition features. And this was touched on um, um, earlier just to say that there is very little of that type of work available, but some small evidence that sarcopenia might be um, associated with a larger area under the dose um, time concentration curve, at least for some drugs. So um, I can finish right here, and I, I think what I'm going to say is I ought to be put in jail um, for promulgating false cut points and that I am subsequently have been sobered up because now that there's enough data around to look at this more coherently, I've come to understand that muscularity is very distinctively related to mortality, like the middle picture, um, to quality of life, like the image on the right-hand side, and to chemotherapy toxicity, according to the image on the left, so these are complex relationships. They're not the same as each other. And had I taken my chemotherapy patients and stratified them according to sarcopenia based on mortality, I would have gotten nonsense. Um, so my plea is for more aggregation of data um, and more information deployed to understand these relationships before we try to boil them down to simplistic bivariate cutoffs and use them as diagnostic criteria. Thank you very much.